Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 204. The Sentence. So much attention is placed when we talk about PhDs and higher degrees. So much attention is placed on scope and scale. This is really big. This is really important. Persistence matters. And all of that is correct. But the consequences of focusing on the scope and the scale of a PhD is we forget about the building blocks of knowledge. And the building block of knowledge is a sentence. But what is a sentence? And what makes a great sentence? And what makes a well dodgy sentence? Well, yes, that is what we're going to talk about in the vlog this week. Now, as we discussed in the last couple of vlogs, academic writing gets a really hard time. It seemed to be boring, dull, predictable and repetitive. And language is simply the carrier of outcomes, the carrier of research results. Now, this assumption I think is fueled by the supposed necessity in scholarship to paraphrase. Now, don't get me wrong, paraphrasing is an important skill reading the work of others, synthesizing, putting it in your own words, and moving the debate on. All of that is incredibly important. But I would argue over-paraphrasing exists in many, many disciplines. And if you think about it, that over-paraphrasing makes a meta point. And that meta point is the way in which academic ideas are conveyed, they don't matter how you convey intellectual ideas, that's not important. Because think about it, what are we doing when we're paraphrasing? We're ripping out <laughs> the outcome, we're ripping out the result, we're ripping out the idea and saying the way in which that idea is encased, oh no, that's not terribly important. The mode of expression supposedly does not matter because the content is all that matters. Now. If that wasn't the case, then why do we all paraphrase so incredibly easily? Great writing, and I mean truly great writing, creates an intimate dance between form and content, the ideas that are being expressed and how those ideas are being expressed. And to be frank, we must remove something, some power some punch, some energy from ideas when we take away their context, when we take away their form. The great sentence aligns almost intimately what is said with how it is said. So think about in your practice, in your research today, how ruthlessly you rip up the ideas of others. Oh yes, it exists in that form, but I'll just grab that and put that into my literature review, bang, bang. And think about what that action suggests about academic writing. Sentences matter to me. And ironically, or perhaps not, one of my most cited ideas, in fact, is a sentence about sentences that comes from the University of Google. And that sentence is, quote, My dream is always the same. To write the perfect sentence. End of quote. My dream is always the same, colon, to write the perfect sentence. And that sentence is truer than I can express. Because I think why I love the sentence so much is that it's so small and it's honest because it leaves no margin for flab or excess or problems. You have to, to create the perfect sentence, focus on every word and how they are positioned. But in so many disciplines, quotations are not used. Oh no, you can't quote. And we need to think about the cost of not respecting the form, the way ideas are expressed by our colleagues, by our fellow researchers. Sentences matter. The remarkable scholar of writing, Joe Moran, stated that, quote, sentences are my core output, end of quote. 
And Henry David Thoreau, and what a sentence this is, Henry David Thoreau stated that, quote, the fruit a thinker bears is sentences. The fruit a thinker bears is sentences. Like, how fantastic is that sentence? I mean, it's singular, plural, it's all going on. It starts with the fruit, always good. So everything is sort of wrong with that thesis, which, which makes it right. So we'll come back to that in a second. So the sentence is a gift. And it is the propulsion of the next sentence. And it is like a jinx, jigsaw puzzle. It has to operate with the words and the ideas around it. And for me, the sentence is the great exemplifier of the notion we've talked about in the last couple of vlogs, that writing is a craft, it's not an art. And the best writers, the best researchers, but the best writers think small. We don't become overwhelmed with the big stuff, or oh, 100,000 words and books and everything very big. Actually, the best of writers live in the present and live in the sentence. And they think about the sentence as a unit for ideas, the sentence as a unit for knowledge. And one of my favorite studies ever, and I get quite emotional when I talk about it, but it's a fantastic example of transposed disciplinarity. But one of my favorite studies ever came from scientists at the Institute of Nuclear Physics in Krakow. And unbelievably, these remarkable scholars decided, you know what, we're going to look at the hundred best works ever in classical literature. Okay, so high culture literature. We're going to take the hundred books that are seen to be great writing. And they analysed those books of literature, so from Dickens, from Beckett, from Joyce and so forth. And they discovered, hang on to yourself, they discovered that great literature, great writing, behaves like a mathematical multifractal. That means the structure of the smallest part resembles the whole. So great writing, the whole, the thesis, great writing can be seen within one sentence. You know someone is a great writer when you look at one sentence. Writing, therefore, is not only a way of communicating, it is a way of thinking. And I always ask you to ponder and try and remember back when you learnt how to write, when you learnt to write a sentence. And of course, most of that knowledge is forgotten. The nature of literacy is we continue to go up that scaffold and we forget where we started. But a lot of you will probably remember the weird lessons we had. So a noun is a naming word, a verb is a doing word, an adjective is a describing word, and when a verb makes a noun do something, that's a sentence. But there are so many guides to good writing, how many how-to guides to writing, there's so many, but so few really understand the doctoral experience, because you as a PhD student, you're managing a lot already. Epistemology, ontology, methodology, experiments that never seem to work, field work that goes a bit pear-shaped. And so we, we endlessly have to juggle. I often think of it as a juggling act. We often have to juggle so many different variables that the sentence, that seems the least of our worries. But it is the building block of meaning and it is the building block of your argument. And also, and this is the trick that no one ever tells you, the sentence is actually the spine of your argument. And the spine of your argument is determined. And here's a trick that changed my life. All sentences are terribly important. The most important sentence is what's called a topic sentence. The topic sentence is the first sentence in your paragraph. It provides the introduction to your paragraph and explains to readers what's going to go on in that paragraph. And the test, and this is the bit that no one ever tells you, the test of a great thesis, the test of a great book, the test of a great refereed article, is that you can read the first sentence of every paragraph, read the topic sentence of every single paragraph, and you will pick up 
the argument. No joke. It becomes the spine, if you will, of your analysis. And you can pick up where the writer, the researcher is going by reading the topic sentences in order. That's a great writer. And by the way, that's also why literature reviews so frequently don't work. You know when you read somebody's liter literature review, never your own. But when you read somebody's literature review and you go, wow, this is dull. Wow. Wow, this is dull. This is really, really dull. My life is slipping away from me. And the reason for that is people have written a literature review without topic sentences. So when you know, you know when you read the literature review, as Smith stated, as Jones confirmed, as Brown argued, boof, 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 boof. So of course they're not topic sentences. They're just introducing a name. Here's another name. Oh wow, Here, oh, here's another name. Here's another name. And literature reviews are sharpened if we're able to put in a topic sentence, so not, here's this author, yawn, but why does this author matter? Topic sentence, then the stuff, then a topic sentence, and then the literature review suddenly holds together and becomes meaningful. Now, I do understand that this can appear really overwhelming, and writing can be tedious, it absolutely can be, but I always really treat writing like a jigsaw puzzle. I find it a lot of fun and I get satisfaction and that's the right word. I get satisfaction by placing the correct word in an interesting phrase, clicking it into a sentence and going, wow, that's unusual, that's interesting. Now if you hate writing and you find it difficult and I hear you brothers and sisters, it's always important I think to just take a breath and diagnose why you think that writing is dreadful. And in our writer's blog gig a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the big issues, why you've got that big issue that's stopping you writing, and that's cool. But this week, everything is in miniature. So I really want to think about what's going wrong in your sentences. And for me, there are two solutions to the most common problems that we see with academic writing. So academic writing, particularly students' writing, can be blunt, predictable and terribly dull and that's caused by a small vocabulary most frequently so a small vocabulary a student is using the same word over and over and over again because you haven't got the diversity of language tools to make your intellectual argument in an evocative way so vocabularies are improved in two ways Reading is the most obvious way. So when you read, learn new ideas, learn new words, and when you come across a new word, as we all do every day, don't sort of gloss over it like your eyes go, yeah, no, nah, yeah, no, nah, next word. Actually pause, go, there's a new word, boom. This is terrific, this is exciting, what does this new word mean? And through my masters and my PhD, if this is useful for some people, I had an exercise book and when I came across a new word that was often specialised vocabulary, in the exercise book I would write it down and its meaning. And when I was then on the train or the bus or in sort of dead time, I would have this exercise book and I would rote learn those ideas so those words were available when I needed them. So learn the meaning. Also, the other way is to be proactive. There's some terrific apps that exist at the moment that deliver an interesting word to you every day. So every day, this app delivers a new word and its meaning. How fantastic is this? You go, wow, that's a new word. So 365 new words are delivered to you in a year. How terrific is this? So a large vocabulary really is a gift, team, because it gives you precision, in your writing, it gives a diversity to your expression, and also it adds a bit of spice and intrigue to your ideas. So if you think about it, writing is really the equivalent of clothes. You may have an absolutely terrific body, and I'm sure you do. You might have an absolutely terrific body, but if you dress it in a potato sack with a belt, darlings, you're not presenting yourself as your best, right? But if you dress your ideas with fabulousness, then they're going to move through the world with punch and energy and attention. Right, so vocabulary. Build your vocabulary. Start today. But the second big idea that may calm you and transform your writing today is as follows. 
remember that the best sentence is a small sentence. The best sentence is a small sentence. And further, the definition of a sentence is it conveys one idea. One sentence conveys one idea. Now, if you break that rule, and great writers do break rules, that's the nature of being a great writer. But if you break that rule, you end up doing the writing equivalent of a high wire act. So, this, and we've all done this, the sentence goes on, and it goes on, <laughs> and it goes on. And there's the noun, and there's the verb. Cool. Okay. Then we add another verb. Then we add another noun. Then we've gone into adverbs and we're just randomly adding adjectives around the nouns and like, wow, what is happening here? How is this sentence going to end? So you're like, so you feel stressed for the writers, like, where's this going? Oh no, how are we going to end this sentence? It's like competitive eating, you know, like the man versus food programs. And I sort of, I get quite stressed watching them because I think, wow, how many hot dogs can that person put in their mouth without exploding, right? And it's the same with writing. It's like, oh wow. Well, there's an adverb, or we're in trouble, there's an adverb, oh no. And so if we can just calm the farm a bit and go, right, one idea, one sentence, then we're winning. And my other rule, I don't use a lot of adjectives. My other rule is if I can cut a word, I will. If the meaning still works when I remove a word, then I remove the word. And that gets the sentences really, really sharp. So with those two improvements, widen your vocabulary and shorten your sentences, that might just sort you out a little bit. And that might be enough from the vlog today in rock and roll. But I understand why writing is so problematic in doctoral programs. Because to be frank with you, we have assumptions. We have so many assumptions about you our PhD students, and most of them are wrong. And one of the assumptions we have is that you arrive into the program able to read at a very high scholarly level in a particular discipline, and you're able to write at a very high level in a particular discipline. But that's a, that's a really weird way of thinking about literacy and numeracy, can I add, because literacy is never completed. It's not a destination. Literacy is a set of competencies. Reading and writing are located on a continuum. So each day we gradually improve. So there is no perfect sentence. The reason why my sentence started with my dream is, is because there is no perfect sentence. I am never going to get there. But for you, there may be 10 quick issues for you to consider. That again, if you want to just push on a little bit more and correct your prose with 10 quick ways that shows you how to rapidly make those changes, that's how I'll finish off the vlog today. So, a sentence can be many things. Don't get me wrong, they start with a capital letter and they finish with a full stop. Unless they finish with a question mark or an exclamation mark, oh, and they start with inverted commas. So between that capital letter and that full stop, there are lots of recurrent issues that we see. So let me just give you 10 proxies, 10 very, very quick ideas and show you what they are proxies for in terms of thinking about writing. Now you can ignore my 10 stylistic worries or you can think about, wow, am I doing this? Okay, let's quickly finish this off. Proxy one, single sentence paragraphs. Now, academic writing, by its definition, builds an argument. And it builds an argument through paragraphing. So remember the importance of that topic sentence? The topic sentence explains what's going on in the paragraph. So if you write a single sentence paragraph, then where is the argument going, right? So it fragments your argument. So if you see people writing very, very short paragraphs, then the argument is fragmented and they don't have a lot to say, right? So that's a problem in terms of argument development and your writing appears fragmented. Wow, it's a problem. Two, the use of long sentences. Now, this is odd. Often you see short paragraphs and long sentences used by the same student. Okay, so they are linked problems. So single sentence paragraphs are often created by a very, very long sentence. Therefore, what happens as you get lost in this long sentence is meaning becomes very murky and it becomes a bit strange because the precision of that single thought is not revealed. 
three. Oh yeah, using words like everybody, society, all of us. Now, those words are proxies for a lack of research. Everybody thinks this. That's a generalization, and that's not what research is about. So everybody does not smoke marijuana. All of us do not agree that Tinky Winky is the best Teletubby, although obviously Tinky Winky is the best Teletubby, but I didn't just say that. So when nouns appear in your sentence like everybody, people, society, they block your thinking because they're generalised and they stop you making the precise series of ideas and arguments that are required in research. Four, oh my goodness, the use of the word nowadays outside of country music. Nowadays, a wow from me. So when a student uses nowadays, oh, it happens. Students are confusing storytelling with research. So also it demonstrates there's probably a vocabulary issue. So we have to create strong transitional phrases in their work. And speaking of transitional phrases, five weak transitional phrases. So when students, and I'm sure you do it, I used to do it, when students use phrases like, let us now, or as I mentioned earlier, they show me that they actually don't know where the argument's going and so they're having to use this pretty weak transitional phrase to get the reader where they need to be. The best of writing is like a waterfall. It's smooth rather than a motor vehicle in need of a service, as I mentioned earlier. So one great sentence flows into the next, into the next, into the next. So transitions, these movements between ideas should be smooth rather than a burnt out clutch in a mini. As I said earlier, conversely, good luck with that. Six, repetition of words, right? Very clear. Students have a limited vocabulary and the student hasn't read enough and their drafting is not intense enough to diversify their words. Can I just say I've been hard there. All of us have favorite words. I have scaffolding, I have enabling. I use them way too often. So what I do is I write my article, I did it this morning, finish and write an article, and then I know I have problematic words. So and I have a list of them, by the way, that I use. And then I go through and I do a search replace through my documents. So, oh, enabling again, I've used it 10 times in this article. I must only use it once. Let's remove the other nine. Okay, so work out what your favorite words are, write them down and remember them and fix them. Okay, we all do it. Seven, using an odd synonym that doesn't fit into the context. Okay, so I know, really I do, I know when you've used a thesaurus function, and can I say, thesaurus, they're magnificent things, because if you need to find different words, that's a great way to do it, knock yourself out. But when you do use that particular way of finding new words, make sure you understand the meaning, because what often happens is, oh, I need to replace that word, and you chunk in something where the meaning's not quite right, so it shows you don't quite know what it means so make sure before you do that replacement you use it as an opportunity to use a new word and that's great but make sure you've got its meaning before you place it there eight huge one changed my life the use of a colon or a semicolon when the student has absolutely no idea how to use them so punctuation is the Darth Vader of writing. You wondered why Darth was with me today? I've done this entire setup so I could point to Darth at this juncture. Thank you all. But punctuation is the Darth Vader of writing. You have to control it or it will kill you. So keep your punctuation precise and well deployed. So the use of colons and semicolons often lead to our incredibly long sentences. Remember that tightrope walking prose? Yeah, we're there. So if you are going to use a colon or a semicolon, use them rarely, use them with effect, and make them operate as almost a way to balance a very short and sharp 
sentence. Particularly, watch your use of a semicolon. Students who fuse sentences use semicolons. So what that means is they express one idea. Remember, a definition of a sentence is one idea is expressed in it. Yeah. So students that go, oh, maybe I can express two or three. So they're shoving those hot dogs in their mouth. So they fuse lots of sentences, and instead of putting a full stop, here's an idea, full stop, they go, oh, uh, let's fuse those sentences and let's put a semicolon in and just hope it sort of hangs together, right? So full stops are the Jedi Knight of academic writing. Full stops are brilliant. Use them, full stops will save you. Nine. Excessive use of I think and I feel. Now, I am not against at all the use of I, we, or mine. I'm not that person. In fact, the bonkers use of third person makes us all sound a bit mad. You know when people do the, the researchers confirm that ethics clearances are in place. Now, firstly, dude, it's you. It's your name on the piece. It's your name on the thesis. Researcher, singular. Researcher, singular. One person, one personality. You are not Sybil. One person, singular. And if it is you, then, you know, use I. That's cool. But what I say to my students is don't prostitute the I. Bit provocative, but the reason I say that is as follows. I don't want students to overuse the word I because it blunts its power. So what I want to do is I want to render your prose more active. And one of the easiest ways to do that, to get it out of the third person and use I. Bang, active, exciting, fantastic. But where I do draw the line is when I is attached to weak verbs. Let me show you. So when students use words like I think, or I feel. Now these phrases weaken your argument. We know what you think, we know what you feel, because that's what you think and what you feel. But I'm not interested in that because this is a PhD. What are you arguing? What can you prove? Be active, come on. What can you prove? What you feel, love, that's great. What can you prove? Bring it. 10. Starting your conclusion with in conclusion. I lose the will to live. Colleagues, think about this. We've got a big heading that says conclusion. We've just read 90,000 words. 90,000 words, big heading, conclusion. And then the student starts the topic sentence with in conclusion, comma. We know it's the conclusion. Don't use in conclusion. So for the rest of your scholarly life, in articles, in books, whatever, never start even the final, it's the final paragraph of an article. We can see it's the final paragraph of an article. Don't use in conclusion. So what you'll do is just do a search for it, just remove in conclusion, never use it. Never use it, get rid of it. And if you get rid of it, watch what happens to your sentence. It becomes active, positive, exciting, Big idea. So in conclusion, softens it, make it strong. You see, great writing is debatable, and I'm sure a stack of you have gone, I really disagree with that, and that's good. I need you to do that. Great writing is debatable. It's like a great track of music. We know it when we hear it. Great sentences are like that great song. You read a great sentence and you just go, wow, we are not worthy, magnificent. But improving your writing today comes from just a couple of decisions for you to make today. Firstly, make a decision that you care about your writing. And secondly, make a decision to think about how you connect your way of thinking with your way of writing. How are you going to connect your way of thinking and your way of writing. If modernism has a characteristic, and it probably has a few, then modernism leaves its scaffold in full view. So we can see how the idea, the building, the artwork has been created. In many ways, you know, that's what the best of academic writing is like. 
you can see the workings. You can see the act of construction. It's left for you to assess and evaluate and respect. And for me, that's the mark of a true scholar. That's the mask of an intellectual. Because we suddenly realise that we are a scholar and we can see how the ideas are created. We're not a wizard behind the curtain. A confident academic allows the spine of sentence construction to be revealed. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.